All right, we're recording and we are live. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the workshop, uh, Contributing to Rep.io. Um, I hope um, that in this session, um, we can explain you how you can start contributing to Rep.io to the project and to the community. And we are all excited to have you uh, as we are looking for more contributors to more people who want to get involved. So who are we? Um, so I want to say a big hello from the um, Technical Steering Committee of Rep.io. Uh, that is Adam, me, Irvin, Kevin, Nicola, and uh, Will. Um, actually, Irvin is on the call um, and will uh, introduce himself in a second. Um, so I want to introduce myself first. Um, I'm Christian, working as a, a software engineer in the open source program office at Sauce Labs, uh, and I've been uh, working on Web.io for almost, I don't know, seven, eight years now uh, as like a site hobby project. And now it became more, more and more my job, uh, which is exciting. Um, and yeah, um, Erwin, uh, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Erwin, uh, Erwin Heitzmann. I'm working for the testers. And uh, I've been working with Web.io, I think, for about four or five years now. Um, been using the tool before I uh, started contributing myself and later on developed myself to uh, one of its members. Awesome. So for this session, we wanted to give you um, a little project overview and want to tell you what kind of packages there exist, um, you know, how the code is structured and how the project is structured, how Web.io is structured um, in different packages. Um, and we want to show you what's a typical development workflow of um, you know of the web terror project looks like like when you project when you want to contribute how you how you can do that how you get started how you run the tests and how you check out the repository um, then we want to explain you the governments and how we run the daily business of the project um, and explain you what you know a contributor is what a project committer is and what we do as a technical steering committee and last but not least um, I want to give you some information about how you can contribute to the project and what's your, you know, the best start for you is. And um, for the last hour of the session, we want to, you know, pick up some tasks and just start coding and to start to contribute to any of the bugs that we have or to anything that you would like to contribute to the project. And we are here for you and, you know, help you, um, you know, with questions and anything that you, you know, any confusions that you might have. Um, so that should take two hours, and um, I'm really excited for it. Um, so we start um, the session with the project overview, and I give it to you, Evan. Thank you very much. I do think you need to update your slides because they haven't moved. Christian? Where, where are the slides now? Uh, at the contributing part. So. We didn't see the updates, I think. Okay, let me check. Uh, I actually see project overview. Oh, you do? All ah, right, then it's just me, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, are you at the, how does the browser automation screen work? I am now. All right, thank you. So um, WebDriveRail is a tool that can be used uh, to automate the browser. And here you see an overview of how this actually works. So in between the browser and WebDriveRail can be a number of things. You can put the driver there. You can put a service there like Appium uh, or a grid, for example, which then in turn steers uh, the drivers for a service like Appium. Um, the drivers are used to automate the uh, browser uh, and uh, Appium and uh, Selene Droid, for example, they use, are used to automate uh, the mobile applications. Um, there's also some, um, some mobile and uh, uh, hybrid apps, for example, and there you have to switch context between the two and uh, they will actually use a driver or an, an Appium on, on the go. Um, on the right side, you actually see uh, tools like Cypress and Test Cafe, Puppeteer, stuff like that. They are increasingly uh, popular. I want to use this to go to the next slide. 
where we actually see a little bit different where we don't have the driver L anymore for the puppeteer example on the bottom. But on the top, you see that uh, web driver, the framework, the protocol that we use overall, actually needs to have this driver, uh, the Chrome driver in this case, as an example, to talk to the Chrome uh, browser. So whenever on the left you see WebDriver.io, so when WebDriver.io is started and it will run your test, and you have a, a, a driver installed, in this case, for example, the Chrome driver, then you will use uh, the WebDriver protocol to talk to this driver, and the driver will communicate that back to the browser. And there's different brow uh, drivers for every browser. So we have the Chrome driver, Gecko driver, uh, the Edge driver, and so on. Um, when you look at Puppeteer, uh, Puppeteer currently supports uh, Chrome, and I think there's a beta or something for Firefox as well. Um, this talks to the uh, browser directly, and it does this through a certain protocol. And this is the same protocol is actually used by the drivers. Can we go to the next slide? So when you look at the, uh, the layers that we have in WebDriver.io, on the left side, you see the protocol packages. Uh, as an example, we've put the, uh, the WebDriver protocol here, but there are many more protocols. We have the Appium protocol, we have the JSON wire protocol. Um, so this is just a way of communication. You can uh, take out a protocol and replace it with another, or you can easily add a new protocol if you would like to. Um, WebDrive it so itself can be added as a or used as a library. Uh, we call this standalone mode. I'm not going to go into this, but uh, it's a way that, that uh, WebDrive Rail can be used. And on the right side, we have WebDrive Rail as a framework. And WebDrive Rail as a framework uh, will be, uh, can be used to uh, include the actual test run. So to highlight the, uh, the way that the protocols actually are used on the next slide. Um, here's an example of how WebDriver can be used directly to create a session uh, on Firefox. And to highlight how uh, important the, um, the commands here are, is that for example, the hash that you see um, when you do the send keys element, uh, send element keys, um, then uh, the hash is actually a static part that is used in, in order to send these commands. Um, how this would look is like on the right left side, you have the property, which is the element hash. On the right side, you actually have the element ID that will be used in any of the uh, requests that will be sent to the browser. Next slide, please. So when you look at Puppeteer, there's uh, another example here uh, where we use the DevTools. And uh, DevTools is the, uh, another name for what Puppeteer is using. It's, it's using the uh, DevTools protocol. And uh, the protocol is mapped to the WebDriver uh, protocol in order to easily swap out the automation protocol for something else. So the example that you see here is exactly like the, or almost exactly like the WebDriver protocol. And that's because we have a mapping for this that we can use so we can easily swap out one or the other. And next slide, please. So when we take a higher overview of WebDriver.io itself, um, WebDriver.io uses the, um, the protocols under the hood. As you can see here, uh, WebDriver.io is import as a library. It will then use the uh, Chrome and it will uh, use different commands because all these commands are then under the hood mapped to the right protocol of your needs. Um, the protocol then contains the, the mappings that it needs to know and it will out automatically figure out what it needs to do based on that. Uh, we also have some, uh, some cool things like we have a retry middleware where we automatically wait on elements, where we execute the commands. When there's a, a still element a reference, for example, we try to refetch the element uh, for a certain amount of time. And if it, it succeeds, it will just continue. And if it will fail, it will uh, throw an error saying that, well, 
even after retrying, we could not find this element for you. Um, it can also wait for elements. So we have a refetch of the still elements. We can also wait on elements uh, uh, that, are, uh, that we want to do an action on. Uh, and this only applies for actual uh, actions like click and, and, and set input, et cetera. Uh, some people call this like uh, support for lazy loading of elements. Next slide, please. So then we also have the uh, command line interface. Um, on the left side, you, on the top left, you can see how you can actually install this. And the uh, command line interface is just a really easy way to create a setup that you like, um, including all these services, reporters, uh, browser drivers, et cetera, that you would like to install. We also have some frameworks that we support, like for example, Mocha, Cucumber, and Jasmine. And uh, here it's very easy to, to create a really nice, um, easy, easy way of installing everything that you need, basically. You can also uh, use the uh, REPL interface that we have, which is a way to run WebDriver.io without installing it, actually. Next slide, please. So then what packages do we actually have? So when you look at the, uh, the overview, we have some core packages, in which case this is, uh, for example, the web driver and the DevTools protocols, um, or packages in this case, which we do need to, to create the mapping that we uh, just explained. Uh, then we have the web driver package itself, which can be used to uh, run without the test runner itself. Um, so it's like pro programmatically or like uh, importing it as a library. And then uh, we also have the CLI, which is a core uh, uh, package needed for when you want to install all, any of the other packages. So then we have some helper packages that we use, for example, the config to create the configuration inside of the uh, command line interface. We have the locker that's uh, used uh, among many different packages. Um, then we have the protocols, the REPL interface that I just talked about, and so on. Then we have some reporters. These reporters are used to translate uh, the actual test results and all the actions that go uh, that happen along the way to your terminal. Uh, but it can also, for example, expand this functionality to uh, output a file, for example, which contains all this information. Uh, you can change the log levels. You can add any kind of um, features that you would like, basically. People have created HTML uh, websites with, with nice formatting and uh, UI. So um, it's basically, if you want to, to have something that's not there yet, you can easily create your own Reaper porter and add it to this list. Uh, the services are basically a way of expanding the current functionality other than the reports. Um, services are basically like a small, small uh, addition to WebDriver.io. Um, I'm not really sure how to explain it any further because like the, the way that services work is, is you, you're Pretty limitless, basically. Uh, there are services for the uh, the Appium service. We have for Appium tools, for a browser stack, so all the service providers that we have. Um, I've seen really, really interesting features that that people have added over the years. And if you you think you have found something that's really useful, you can always shoot the team a message, like saying, "Hey, I've created this. I think it's really awesome, and I would like to." put this forward and then we can add it to the website if it's uh, a really cool feature. Uh, next slide, please. So then we also have two runners. Um, we have a local runner to, uh, to run your, um, uh, which is the main way of, of running WebDriver.io. But then we also have a Lambda runner. Uh, and this is uh, to run WebDriver.io in Lambda functions. We have the framework adapters, which are the frameworks that I talked about, the Cucumber, Jasmine, and Mocha frameworks, which are uh, basically test runners, which are used in, uh, to run WebDriver.io. Um, when you use WebDriver.io as a library, it's a different story. It will not run this, for example. 
And then we have some other packages, uh, which you see a little uh, list of. Uh, next slide, please. And then we have a, a small overview of the, uh, the GitHub project. So on top, you see the GitHub templates. We have some workflows there. Uh, for example, we have the, um, the GitHub actions there as well. Uh, we have some markdown files to generate the project documentation. Um, I think it's very, very clear how we separate all the uh, logic. Um, for example, we have a end-to-end -end test tool uh, folder as well. There's some smoke tests there, uh, which we go on, we'll get over into a little bit later. Um, yeah, if you uh, if you have any question about this, please let me know. But I think that this is a very, very clear overview of uh, all the files that we have in the project. Uh, next slide, please. So then we have some uh, w, uh, WIO commands. This is just an, an overview that I took from the website. Uh, all the uh, flowcharts that we have available can be found on the link that you see on the top right, or uh, bottom right. Uh, so what we see here is that the uh, command line interface that we just uh, discussed um, will take the arguments that you pass, or if you pass any at least, and then you see that you can run the uh, WIO command dash dash help, for example. And if there's a command in included, it will take either one or the other route. Um, we have a config route where we uh, can create a configuration file for you. We have the REPL where we can run the, uh, the web driver environment without installing anything. Uh, we have the install and the run. So, Whenever you're going to work on the project and you question yourself, like, how is this all connected? Then the, uh, the flowcharts are a really good way to get a grasp of how everything is intertwined. Next slide, please. So now we've discussed the, uh, the important things that you need to know before we actually talk about the code. Like, we know how the, uh, the GitHub page looks. Uh, how the project is structured a little bit, where you can find more information, how everything is connected. Uh, and we also know how the, uh, how the, the, the tool talks to the actual uh, browser. So let's talk a little bit of, about code now. So how can you actually get started? Um, first, you actually check out the code. So we clone the project to a local directory by doing a git clone. And then we uh, move to the, uh, to the directory. And then of course, we install all the dependencies that it needs. And in this case, you can do an npm install and then npm run setup dash full, which will install any dependencies over the whole project that it, it needs or that it requires. And then um, when once everything is installed, of course, you want to know, like, am I starting with a clean slate? So you want, would like to run the unit test and the smoke test. For that, you can uh, run the uh, npm run test double dot uh, coverage. Um, you can also run uh, these commands for just a single uh, package if you'd like. So when you're working on a small isolated uh, area, which does not uh, connect in any way with the other packages that we have. You can also uh, find in the, in, the, uh, in the readme or the contribu uh, contribution uh, markdown file that we have, how you can actually run these files for just a single uh, package. And then the smoke test can be run uh, by doing a npm run uh, test smoke. On the next slide, we see a little overview of all the uh, guards that we, so to speak, have. So we do some linting, we have some dependency checker, we have some typings that we have, uh, which are based on the TypeScript uh, typings. Uh, I think it uses the JS doc um, uh, notation. Uh, we have some unit tests, we have some smoke tests, and we have some end-to-end -end tests. So depending on the change that you make, um, you have to decide like um, what what's applicable here to to run basically. Um, 
for example, when you, you just change a little isolated thing, then it might be that you just want to run the unit test that you've added and, and, and of course, all the other unit tests that you did. Uh, but sometimes you want to also run the smoke test and the end-to-end -end test as well. Uh, these are all ran when, when you uh, push your code to the, uh, uh, when you create your pull request, basically. So the, uh, the CI CD environment will also run this for you. So next slide, we see the, uh, the get ready for development slide, I think now, is that correct? All right, so um, everybody likes to work differently, but I believe that uh, Christian uses this way of working where he watches the files. So he does a um, um, run watch, which uh, triggers uh, a, uh, it compiles the packages for you when you make changes. And then uh, you can run the uh, Chrome driver on a specific port uh, and using verbose. So you see the dash dash verbose to uh, sign us it basically. Or I think for both is actually mm, logging more. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, when, when you make changes, you can also do this with the um, with the test runner, I think, where you watch for any uh, test changes. So when you combine this, whenever you make some changes, you will see if your tests are actually passing or not. And I think uh, with that, if we check the next slide, I think we have one more example. Yeah, we, we're pretty much basically ready to, uh, to start coding, but there's one last slide where we have some test examples. And these files can be found under the, uh, the examples directory in the GitHub project, where we have a small overview of different kind of examples where we have mobile testing, uh, cloud connections, uh, how we use multi-remote, page objects, all that kind of stuff. So uh, if you have any questions on, uh, um, well, we have some examples there as well uh, for you to look at if you have any questions. And I think that wraps, wraps up the uh, development part. Thank you, Evan. Um... I would like to continue with the governance um, of the project. Um, as I mentioned before, the project governance pretty much codifies how we project maintainer handle the day-to-day -day business, meaning how and who is allowed to merge pull requests, who is allowed to uh, you know, release new packages, who is allowed to do something else. Um, and the governance really helps us here to codify that and make sure that we, you know, we treat everyone um, or we do this properly in a documented way. So when you read the first sentence of the project governance um, um, description, it says, the web developer project wants as much as possible to operate using procedures that are fair, open, inviting, and ultimately good for the community. For that reason, we find it valuable to codify some of the ways that the project goes about its day-to-day -day business. We want to make sure that no matter who you are, you have the opportunity to contribute to web development. We want to make sure that no corporation can exert undue influence on the community or hold the project hostage. And likewise, we want to make sure that corporations which benefit from our bureau are also incentivized to give back. This document describes various types of contributors work within the Bureau project. So the, the main reason why we have this governance is that we want to make the decision-making fair, equal, and democratic. There's no one who should just own the whole project. Uh, we want to avoid the bass factor effect, which means that you know, whenever someone decides to leave the project and doesn't want to contribute anymore, there are other people that can take over that have access to code and to the packages. We want to also allow that every, the project direction can be influenced by anyone. Uh, so whoever contributes to the project and invests into it, um, he should be able to, into, to influence it as well. And then we want that people are get because people that are engaged are also promoted and um you know um that you know get something out of contributing to the project and we've defined four essentially four different kind of roles in the projects which are a users that are people who use and advocate web uh, that are contributors who is someone who has contributed to the project in form of a code pull request 
um, they are project committers, um, that are people that have shown a constant record of contributions. And there's a technical steering committee, which essentially leads the project. Well, as a user, you pretty much, you know, you use Web.io, and uh, anyone can become a user without even knowing it. Once you use Web.io in your company, once you, you know, tweet about it and say how awesome Web.io is, you become a web, essentially a Web.io user and part of the community. As a next step, you kind of like use Web.io a lot and like me wanted to, you know, think about contributing something, you know, you found something missing in the documentation um, and you want to change that. Um, so with that, you create a pull request and change something anywhere in the code. Um, and that makes you automatically a project, um, a, 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 the project contributor. So anyone who's done one or multiple pull requests uh, becomes that. So once you show a lot, like a bit of engagement, once you have um, helped other people with issues, helped on the support channel, and has uh, have made a bunch of PRs uh, to the project, uh, you become a committer. And with that, we invite you to the web Dev organization. You will become right access to the uh, repository. And um, you can help us even more uh, by you know, closing issues if um, questions are answered, um, by committing code, and so on. It's just one more level of engagement um, to the project that lets you become uh, a project um, contributor, a uh, committer. And last but not least, there's the technical steering committee, which are which consists of people that have you know shown a, a high record of contribution, who have led certain initiatives in the project, and have an overall understanding of the code. Um, what you become a, a, a TSC member once you have roughly uh, committed over twenty qualifying pull requests uh, in whatever shape or form, and you become you you get nominated by one of the existing technical student committee members, which is, you know, fairly easy. So once you're part of the project committee, uh, of the technical student committee, you can release packages of the project um, and you help even more steer the direct direction of it. So now that we know the code, once we know, now that we know how we can contribute to certain things, how we can run, how we can pull the code, and how, you know, how my role in the project looks like, Let's, uh, let's find out how we can contribute, actually. <clears throat> Before we go into the topic, though, we should answer, you know, why should I contribute to the project? You know, why should I spend my free time um, to contribute to a project um, that I use at work? So I, there's, you know, there are a lot of incentive for different kind of people. Um, I put some of mine uh, in here. Uh, where I would start with giving back to the community, I think is one of the biggest uh, incentives for me uh, to contribute to the project. Uh, I know that I use almost every, everywhere an open source project where people have invested their free time into it, so I can use it for free. And I think it's just important to be a good citizen to just, uh, to just give back to the community and help, um, help the projects that I use the most. It also helped me when I started working on Web.io to understand the framework better. And by, as I write tests um, in my day-to-day -day business, I, it helped me to understand where the errors in my tests come from and how I can fix them. Um, when, I just, you know, when you just use the Web.io uh, as a framework, you sometimes you know, are, not, are not aware how things work under the hood. And this will really help you to, to understand that. It also understands it also helps you to understand what are the limitations of certain automation practices that you do. Because as you get more familiar with the limitation of the framework, you also understand better what you can do and how you can do, uh, how you can test certain things. It's of course always good if you are able to influence the project. You know, if you have a specific requirement in your day-to-day -day job where you want, to you want to have that be done by Web.io, being a contributor or a technical steering committee really helps you to easier um, add or propose such features and uh, implement them. Contributing to open source in general helps you to improve your coding skills as well as um, build up your reputation that you can leverage for your own career. Um, 
And last but not least, you meet uh, wonderful people on the way, and it's, it is personally uh, really fun to do. Christian, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I know we didn't discuss this, but I just wanted to mention that actually all of this really applies to me. Um, like when I uh, started contributing to WebDriver.io, I actually got my current job as a uh, as a result of all the hard work that I did because it it showed people saw this, and someone who was also active in the uh, back then the Protractor and the WebDriver.io project actually invited me to uh, their company back then. So that's like a perfect a perfect example of how these things can can levitate you or uh, leverage you uh, up to, uh, to better places. Absolutely, yeah. So to get started, there are various uh, varieties of ways how you can contribute to the project. You know, most of the people think of contributing to open source is just you, know, you have to contribute code, but that's not always true. Uh, we are really looking, every project looks in how they can improve the documentation. And as you use WebDriver more and more, you find places in the documentation where you think this can be actually improved um, to help people understand this area better. Um, you can help us out on the GitHub support channel, where we have over, we have, uh, over uh, 5,000 people, I think, um, asking questions every day. And you know, we are just a handful of people, uh, and we want to help everyone out there. It's always good to create educational content. That's how Kevin actually joined the, uh, joined the project and became a technical student com uh, committee member. By He, he wrote the uh, learn.webdavero um, uh, video course. He created that. Uh, and he has a bunch of great YouTube content uh, where he explains how Webdavero works. Um, so he's an awesome guy. Um, you can also contribute by just spreading the good word via Twitter or any other social media. Um, you can help us discover bugs and create bug reports. Um, you can make feature requests if you think something could be added to the project and is useful. And you know, just be creative. Um, I know you you have all talent, and you know you can just use apply your talent to the project and help it out. To get started on the issues, we have a labeling system that allows you to quickly find bugs that you can start working on. Uh, we have. We highlight our bugs uh, with the bug label or enhancement label when this is something that is new and needs to is a new feature. Um, I really like to highlight the first timers only label, which has like a, bad, a good description on how this specific problem or feature uh, has to be implemented, and it um, invites you. It, it gets you better understanding uh, compared to some other issues that need more information. Good first pick is similar to that, where you know it's it's a good first lay, it's a good first issue that has a limited scope and helps you to you know get your feet wet. And every issue that you see that has a help wanted is something where we as a as a team don't have enough time to work on this, so we actually actively looking for people that um, want to get involved in this. If you create an issue, there, you know, there's a couple of good practices that you, know, you should follow. Um, one of them, for instance, is that it's always good to follow the issue template, uh, where we ask you to provide the version number and, and a reproducible example, which is really important for us to reproduce the problem and the bug on our side. Um, otherwise, it is really difficult to understand how and where to fix the problem. And um, with a minimal reproducible example, um, that can really make a big difference. Um, think about that. You know, if, if, if we should help you to fix a bug, then we kind of need to understand where we need to fix it. And it, like this reproducible example uh, does that. And you don't need to really like copy all the code that you are working on to like a new GitHub repository. It really just helps us to have like a simple file that can reproduce the issue or have a simple test runner project that, uh, that reproduces the issue. Another important part is um, providing error logs um, and as much logging as possible. Use the gist format for that or any other place where you can dump logs. Um, and <clears throat> especially if you import these logs into the issue thread, 
Make sure you use the proper markdown format with the three uh, ticks. Uh, otherwise, it will be really difficult to understand where the logs started and where they stop. Of course, always provide a descriptive title and description. Um, there are a lot of issues that just say WebDriver doesn't work. And this not really tells us what exactly is going on. And at the end of the day, um, for questions, we kind of like uh, canceled the support for questions on GitHub because we made the experience that on the Gitter support channel, we can much easier interact with you um, through the chat. And there's also a bunch of people that can help you out more than just the collaborators on the project. So let's say here's a simple example. If you want to start working on any on a bug or issue, you go on the repository website, um, you filter the, pro uh, the issues based on the good first pick or first timers only issue, and you pick up one of them. And uh, really, if you you know if you see something that is not well descript uh, uh, described enough, or you need some more information to solve this. You know, always feel free to post in the issue your questions and either the issue, the person that has created the issue or one of our contributors uh, will help you out. There's also another way to contribute to the project, which is looking at the roadmap and, you know, providing a new feature to the project. Even though we have a roadmap, it doesn't necessarily say that we, that we completely are focused on that. Uh, it kind of like helps to steer into the right direction. But if you come with an idea where we say, yeah, that definitely makes sense to add to the project and to the framework, uh, then we definitely add this to the roadmap without questioning. Um, but the current roadmap description or the current roadmap list gives you kind of like a hint where you could get involved. There are some interesting projects, for instance, um, uh, the, where is this? the WebDriver of Fiddle platform, where we want to build a website where you can run WebDriver code in the browser, connecting to a cloud provider or to uh, you know, a Docker hub uh, somewhere in the cloud uh, to execute the test. We already had something like this, and we saw it really valuable. valuable. Um, so if you're a front-end engineer uh, that likes to build websites, um, then you know, help us out with the Fiddle platform. Or you know, if you like to create these uh, videos, then you know, help us out build a video for a certain command or for a certain section in the documentation page. And they're all like, you know, the direction where you, you know, can get involved with your own ideas and your own, uh, you know, uh, suggestions. And making the PR, PR is really as easy as, you know, making the pull request, create a fork, um, pushing to your fork um, on GitHub, and then make a pull request to the master branch in the web server project. And we currently don't really have a format on how these pull requests should look like. The most important part for us is that you know, the tests are passing and that the change that you're proposing makes sense. And then you know, it goes as quickly as uh, saying, looks good to me, we merge it, and it will be part of the next release. And you're not alone in this journey. Um, if you want to start contributing, if you have you know, issues uh, with that, you can always go come to the GitHub support channel and instead of asking questions on how to use RepDiver, you can ping the, uh, our, the contributors directly if, they, if these questions are relating to, a contributing, to contributing to the project. We also have a Slack channel. Um, and again, if you ever, if you come to cross an issue where the, you know, the issue document, uh, information is not um, complete and you have questions to it, Never hesitate to just ask for information in that issue. And with that, I want to also announce a new thing that we want to start in the project, which is the contribution office hours. Uh, so if you have an issue that you want to work on, you can uh, schedule a one-on-one -on -one peer session uh, with me. Uh, I have blocked two hours a week for that. And we, have, we can like uh, block one hour a week to just actively work one-on-one uh, -on, -one on this particular bug or feature or whatever you want to contribute. And I'm happy to help you, you know, help you along the way. With that said, um, let's get started. Um, so I hope that somehow explains how you can contribute to the project and how we can get started. I would like to ask you to, um, you know, 
start looking into the repository and filter the issues for uh, good first timers only. I recently added a couple of good issues that you can start um, with. Uh, we have, for instance, um, fixing a test that we currently have uh, that we're currently skipping in our unit test. Um, there are some issues and bugs that uh, needs attention that have a fairly limited scope. Um, and there are some you know, TypeScript issues that we can resolve. Um, or you can just think about any other contribution that you might want to do. And we are happy to help you on the way here via chat, or you can just unmute yourself and ask questions if you have. Um, and um, yeah, uh, we are here to help you out. Does anyone have questions so far on the presentation or anything related to the contribution process? Okay. I do see that we have a question from Quinn in chat. Oh. Uh, he missed the development workflow, I think. Is that still the case, uh, Quinn? The development workflow. Um, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can actually showcase that in live. Let me share a different screen. So, okay. Um, can you see my IDE and stuff like that, Kevin? For me, it says that you started screen sharing, but I don't see the screen. All right, let me try that again. Desktop one, share. I think it's actually sharing it on the, not in Zoom, but the uh, Kiko chat maybe. Um, so I think that the others can see it, but I don't. I don't see the green. Let me try something else. Let me just. Yeah, it's visible for everyone but me. <laughs> Do you see my ID now? Yep. OK, perfect. Uh, so here on the, I've checked out the web WebDevL code. Um, what you, of course, do is, um, as Erwin has explained before, once you have checked out the code, um, you can you should install the dependencies with npm install. Um, this should install all the project dependencies that we use to to work on the project, like yarn learner, uh, not yarn, but learner, and all the uh, dependencies that we have to create all these packages. And what you then should do is run setup minus full, which res resolves all the dependencies of the sub packages that you see here. WebDIO uses a, a mono repo system based uh, using the learner framework. And so all the packages that we have in our mono repo and that we officially you know, come from the WebDIO organization live in here. Everyone besides the assertion library, actually. But um, other than that, everything lives here. And um, you see that the format is pretty much the same as with NPM. The WDO minus dot reporter is then the at WDO slash dot reporter on NPM. So once you have run that, that actually can take up to a minute or two, depending on how fast your system is, because there's a, we already have, we are at like 36 packages now. and Resolving all the sub dependencies can take a while. Um, and once you have that, you create, um, yeah, that's typical with the, let me, Tmax. Oh. Okay, I can have the Tmax session here. That's great because then I can have multiple, uh, multiple terminal sessions here, uh, which I need because I want to. Um, run the watch command, which watches all these all the JavaScript files in the project for all sub package. So every every time you make a change, um, you Babel is triggered and um, compiles the files again, um, so that you can you know have a really short cycle of making changes, testing it, making changes, testing it. 
So once that is run, it continues watching the files. And when I want to you know, do changes on everything, I usually start up Chrome driver because it's, um, you know, it's really fast to start up a Chrome session and make changes to it. So you can use Gecko driver as well and make tests on Firefox, but I usually start um, Chrome driver. And then we have the example section, which Erwin mentioned before that is for us as contributors, not only well uh, good for documentation purposes, but also to run certain scenarios where you want to change something and you want to make sure that it works. And we don't want you to spend a lot of time um, creating that example for you. We have a bunch of things already there. We have a script that runs Appium. Um, we have a bunch of scripts, uh, some other scripts that connect to a different cloud vendor, like Browser Stack, Sauce Labs, and uh, Cobiton. We have a script that um, runs the DevTools service um, and makes some performance tests. We have a script for multiple mode, uh, where it's a little script that logs into a chat and makes some interactions um, and connects to WebRTC channel. Um, so you can use that if you have changes for multi remote. Uh, page object, um, if you want to test how page objects work. But I mostly go into the WIO section, which has an example for the test runner. And I usually use a mocker one because um, I usually write test a mocker. Um, so I would go in my terminal, I would go to the example directory to the WIO um, directory, and it has a package JSON. So if you, if you look into the package JSON of that specific directory, it has all the prepared uh, commands in there to run the scenario for a specific framework. For, for my mocker example, I just need to copy that and say npm run test mocker. And if I run it, you see that Chrome driver now hits off. And my Chrome, you don't see that probably yet, but in the background, my Chrome starts and um, my test passes. The test is really minimal. It just essentially opens webdriver.io and asserts the, the title of the page. So this is your basic setup. Um, this is all you need to get started. Let's say. We want to change something in the spec reporter. We have the spec reporter here. We can see it, um, the output of it. And let's say we want to modify what's, what's the prefix of every line of this reporter. For that, we look into the code of the spec reporter, um, into the source code. Um, the source code, once compiled, moved the file to the build. And this is being used and published also to NPM. Uh, but we are working in the source code, in the source directory. Uh, the package has two files. Uh, so we look into the index.js, which is essentially the reporter. Um, so here it is a function that is executed once the runner ends. It's called print report. And this reports the header and then an empty line, the results, the the amount of test passes and the failure if something is broken. So then let's look into where the preface, I see something here like a preface. Where does the preface comes from? The preface is here and it gets an environment combo based on capabilities and whether or not it's multi remote and the CID. And so we can just go ahead and change something here, saying hello world, press save. You see that it was automatically recompiled. And if we now run the test again, the Chrome browser starts up, small test goes, and there we go. We have changed the spec reporter to have an hello world um, output. And this you can do with pretty much every reporter that we have, with every service that we have. Um, and every utility thing that we have. Um, you just start your, you watch the files, you start Chrome driver. Um, I can even show an example without, 
Chrome driver, as Evan mentioned, Web driver can run with two protocols, the Web driver protocol as well as the Chrome DevTools protocol using Puppeteer. So if I close up Chrome driver, there's no driver listening on Web driver commands anymore. And Web driver is smart enough to detect this and still actually not open the browser because it wants to connect to localhost and port 444. Uh, so setting this essentially says web driver, hey, I want to connect to a web driver server. But since I don't have that, I comment this out. And now web driver has no information to connect to and uses Puppeteer under the hood to run um, Chrome with Puppeteer. Um, this takes a little bit longer because Chrome, starting Chrome with Puppeteer is not that fast, but it does the same. It runs Chrome. Um, with the same commands that we use for the WebDiver, but using the Chrome DevTools protocol. That's essentially it. Um, any questions to that? Awesome. Um, and I can share screen. Go back to the slides. <clears throat> okay. If we look, if we take a look into the issues, I think also uh, as well. If you if you want to start working on an issue, make sure that you make a note that you know you are taking this on and I'm assigning that to you. Otherwise, it will be more than one person works on the same issue and this might be confusing and we, you know, someone's work would be for no reason. So if you start working on an issue, make sure you, you comment on it and say, hey, I'm taking this on and uh, working on it so I can assign it to you. Uh, but essentially, um, let's say look into the first time as only something that is really well good to start is um, if you want to start with, I guess, I guess a really good way to start looking into the packages and understanding the code is um, help with this specific ticket um, where we are looking into someone who, who helps us documenting the readme files, the readmes of every project, sub project that we have. So if we are looking into these packages, you will see that, for instance, WDO minus CLA has almost no documentation to it. Um, it would be helpful for people, for users to understand what this package is doing. Um, so you, it would be great if someone could write some external documentation, how to run specific commands, um, or how to, um, what the commands are. Actually, we could orient ourselves to pretty much copy and paste what we have here. Because I guess it makes sense to, yeah, we have all this documentation here and someone could just, you know, copy the content from here and move it into the readme of the CLI package. So whenever someone um, looks on NPM, and looks for the WDAO CLI package, he has some more information than just this uh, little note. Um, furthermore, there are like the WDI logger. Well, it, it has a well, like a good description of how you use this internal tool and how you can work with it. But there are like other packages where this is not really well described, uh, I would say. WDR protocols is well described. Let's see. Um, all the services are usually well described because we we copy the content from the readme into our documentation page. So if this is this automatically will be released in the website. But for packages that we use internally, for instance, WDR config, it has also almost no description. And we don't have like that. There, there are different ways how you can um, uh, document that. I think the most important part is how is documenting the interfaces that this package provides. 
So if someone wants to use it internally to build a feature, he has some information to, to work on. This would be that. So there are multiple you know, independent contributions that are based in this ticket. Uh, another one that is, has a fairly high level scope, uh, low level scope is the issue on how to move the docs to docosaurus. Uh, the web Devil project uses docosaurus IO to build the documentation page and they have recently um, released a version two to it, which I think might be already out of the beta state uh, because I don't see any notification on that in here anymore. So we want to also update our documentation to use docosaurus too. Uh, so you can help us key on that. Um, what else? Um, <clears throat> there's another documentation on how to run tests in GitHub Actions. Uh, this is already well described because we have the Jasmine boilerplate that already uses GitHub Actions to run web WebDevelo tests. Uh, if you have an example here, um, checking out the code, installing, um, installing Puppeteer, no, installing NPM, uh, using NPM to install the project, project and um, then run the command. What else? Yeah, there's an issue on the Lua reporter that cannot, that has a problem when the DevTools protocol is used. It seems to not emit certain information. Uh, this could be also something that someone can work on. Feel free, does anyone have questions to one of the issues? Feel free to unmute yourself and, and just uh, say something. I think they're already creating the pull requests, uh, Christian. <laughs> they do? That's awesome. <clears throat> Let me see. Oh yeah, there is also, we also have um, some other packages um, like the expect web demo, the assertion library that we embed into the test runner since version six. Um, this is lives in a different repository because it has not that many dependencies to other packages. <clears throat> so here we have, for instance, um, the code coverage of 63%, um, which is way below expectations. The main repository, I think, has over 99%. Uh, so having a good coverage is key if we want to release with confidence. Uh, so you can just you know, click on this code cough button, which will tell you the areas where uh, we have not enough coverage. So you click here on sauce, and then you can see how much percent is already covered. And I think the matchers don't have a lot of coverage. You see this function, this function has no coverage at all. Um, so you can use, <clears throat> you can use this to make, to, to, um, to help testing this part of the code because it's currently not tested at all. And every single you know, contribution to code coverage is super important and helps us to release a package with much more confidence. Like I know with the amount of tests that we have in WebDevO that there, it is very unlikely that we break anything if the tests are passing. And if, the, if we still introduce a problem or if we still introduce a regression, then it's, it's our fault by not writing the test for it. 
and maybe you can also go a little bit more into the specific tests in general. Um, so let me switch back to my IDE. Stop share, share screen. Um, share that. So we have a bunch of tests as Irvine has described that you can use to make sure that you know you can run certain parts of the code or you can just test if your changes are working. In general, every sub package has a tests folder where you see tests for every specific file. Uh, usually you see for every file a, um, a test to it in the test for folder. So for util.js, there's a utils test.js. And in this test file, you, you see that we write tests using just um, as a test framework. <clears throat> and you can just go ahead and you know, take some code and write essentially tests for it. Um, those are the unit tests. Um, usually, ESLint tests should give you should work out of the box if you use an IDE that supports it. So, if I add a semicolon, which is against our coding standards or not coding standards, but against our way how we write the code in this project, then it will tell you immediately the error and the problem in your IDE. If it, and if not, you can always run. If I save this, you can always run. NPM run test. Uh, no, this is wrong directory. So I go back in the main NPM run test and we use test yes lint. So this will run the linter for the whole project and should hopefully file my problem that I have introduced there. Um, There we go. Extra semicolon in this test file on line 79. Um, if we remove this, we are good to go. Then you, if you want to run the specific unit test, um, let's, try, let's say you want to add one specific test to your feature. I always go ahead and say, OK, I write a test that I only want to execute. So I add it with test.only. And then I write some some useful description of the test and say, all right, here's my test. And I just say, console log, let's go. Uh, and while I'm developing, actually, I never care about ESLIN and other things. I just write code and fix all the ESLIN issues at the end. So we have one added one single test in one of the sub packages. And what you don't want is to run the unit test suite for all packages at the same time, because that will just take a minute. And I want to make quick changes and see if my unit tests will pass. So what you can do is you use suggest CLI to exactly address your specific test. And um, so what you can do is npx, so execute just um, which will automatically use the jest that you install with Rep.io. Um, and you say, execute the test of the WDO CLI package in the utils file. And since I want to see how I progress in writing my test, I want to watch my changes with the watch uh, argument. And um, since we always um, measure the coverage, um, you can. Um, ignore that and just silent that by saying coverage report is LCOF. So this will not create a huge list of all the files that, um, that it doesn't take the coverage from all files. Uh, it just uh, takes, it just ta doesn't take the coverage at all. It's just for the, the reporting is really minimal so that you can see everything in one screen. So if we run this, it will only run this test that I ha have sent test.only, everything that I have here. Everything else is will be skipped. And we see this in here. Uh, it takes a while. And then I see my some useful description that passes, but I don't see my hello world. Let's see if I run this again. 
Okay, um, in that sense, I sometimes also just comment things out because they, I don't have enough display here. So just doing, commenting every other test out and I see everything that I have here. So then I can write my tests and say, use the just assertion to say like expect one to be one, that should pass. But if I say one to be two, it should fail. And yeah, it takes, it takes a long time if it, because it creates coverage. If I remove that coverage directory, I hope it gets easier or quicker. Yeah, that's a, that's a problem of having a lot of unit test files. It takes a long to get the coverage, but you get the idea that, you know, now you can work on your individual function that you write. And one of the things that I like to do is if we just take a random function out here of the class, let's say something that's reasonable of size, let's say this function, I usually copy it into my test. So I have the code that I want to test um, at the same time of writing the test. So I can exactly do execute it in a way that it returns an expected value. And um, then I can then I exactly see how I can cover every line. Um, it really helps me, you know, to not have to switch back and forth between files, which takes a lot of time. I want to see the code that I'm testing at the same time while I'm writing the test, which is perfect personal preference, but it might help you to, you know, write these tests a little bit faster. So at the end, we enable all tests again, run it, and make sure that running these tests in a row also passes. And there we go. Kevin, do you know anything else I could look into? Uh, no, not right now because I'm still watching a black screen, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, let me think of something uh, in the meantime. I think that for me personally, the uh, flowcharts are very helpful for when um, for, to get an idea of where you have to start or uh, where you have to look. Um, okay. Because get a, getting a grasp on the the, the issue that you're uh, issue that you're looking at is oftentimes the the trickiest part. Right. And then it's like deciphering all the little changes in the code and uh, and, and go go along. Um, so yeah, understanding the code, how, how it's structured, which we've already uh, discussed, alongside with the flowchart should give you a pretty good idea of how to, where to get started. Can, we, can you see my screen now? Maybe it works now? No, but it was working fine for the others. So I think it's uh, a, me, a me issue and not a you issue. <laughs> can anyone confirm if the sharing screen works? I can see your screen. Oh, perfect. Not currently. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I thought about maybe leaving for a little bit to see if uh, we can. Yeah, you can just rejoin the test session and might start working again. All right. Very good. Okay. So yeah, I guess that was a good suggestion to go through the flow charts um, that someone actually contributed. Um, to the project, which was, was really awesome. Uh, someone who liked this library and, and liked to make flowcharts and he helped us to make these flowcharts. And we were just happy to introduce them into our documentation page. Uh, so it has flowcharts for different kind of, uh, for, for one, for the CLI, um, for the CLI tool. 
uh, where you see um, the different commands that can be executed and what this does. Um, so let's say here you say WDAO run and um, you say REPL install one of these commands, then there is this another flowchart here where you can click and it shows you what happens if you, for instance, say install. Um, if you say WDA install, it asks you for the type and the name of the service and uh, installs the package uh, using npm or yarn, whatever you have installed, and then tries to add it to your WDA config. Um, this needs to be taken, like this needs to be used carefully because however you have formatted the config, we could make a wrong uh, search and replace. Uh, so always check if we have done the modification to your config file properly, but improve, essentially it, it helps you to make to add a service without you know making changes in the code. Then we have the config command uh, where you know you get a bunch of questions asked, and um, then based on you want to run in sync or not in sync, it will install W or sync or not. And if you use it with dash dash yarn, it will use yarn to install it, to use that package manager to install everything. And then at the end, it creates a real config. And you can actually map that directly, like the person who created that actually looked into the code and looked what's happening behind it. So you can quite basically see this as like a high level overview about the code that's happening. On the test execution side, we have um, let's see what's easier to start with. Okay, yeah. So when you kick off a test in Rep.io with the test runner, we have a launcher class in the CLI that starts an instance, a worker instance. And depending on what kind of runner you have, and currently we only have the local runner, uh, it uses that interface to start an instance. For the local runner, this is a, a process, a, a, a normal process on your machine where a node script is being executed. So think about of if you start WebDAV as a test runner, you have a WDIO process. And then for every test that you run, there's a separated process where the test is being executed. And the local runner is responsible for starting this, um, for starting this local process and the worker and pretty much um, listens to messages that the test runner sends this next to the process. And for instance, now run the test and now get me all the results so that we can get all the information from the worker and um, display them either in the standard out of the test runner or propagate them to the uh, services and reporters. So there are various of messages that you can see in the code and we, you know, the local runner post, uh, sends a post message to the sub process to start the test run. And some arguments are being passed into the sub process. <clears throat> so if you, you know, have a service that changes the capabilities in the on prepare hook of your service, these information are being propagated into the uh, worker process. So with that, you can change the, for instance, the connection details of um, of, a serve, uh, of your test run, let's say with the Chrome driver service or with the um, Appium service, we change the port and the host name to connect to Appium or, um, or browser stack, for instance, or Chrome, uh, Chrome uh, when you have that service installed. And yeah, then the every runner, pro, every runner plugin, like a local runner or the Lambda runner that is still experimental, and currently not usable, they use the wdr runner package to initialize the framework, to initialize Mocker, Jasmine, or Cucumber, and kick off the process, listening to every event, propagate these events to the reporter, and make sure that the process or the browser is um, shut down gracefully, and all the information are passed in properly. Yeah, the test execution in general, either with the 
this is for the chest runner as well. Before session, okay. Yeah, this is what happens in the at WDI runner. Um, so if the local runner has started a worker process and starts executing, it starts executing the runner, which essentially initiates all the test reporters. It initiates the frameworks and the services. Um, so if you know if you said my test framework is mocker, then it loads the WDL mocker framework. It initiates all the services, the before session hook, as well as the before um, before hook, and then it runs the test framework. So the test framework, let's say the at WDL mocker framework has a, a run function in it, and this one function will initialize mocker at the end and starts um, the browser. And when we start the browser, we check if there's any indication to start it with WebDriver. If you have you know, a host name and a port set up in your config file, then we know we want to connect to a WebDriver uh, server. Um, if there's no driver running and there's no indication for a driver, then we start to run the session with Papier. Um, we initialize the browser global, the browser variable to the global instance. So you can just type browser.command in your test. Uh, you don't have to you know, set up the session by yourself. It's all done by the test runner, by the WAO runner package. And then it checks if the tests have been run successfully. It propagates the messages to the reporters and back to the main process to show off the information in the standard out. And that's almost it. It prints the summary um, and um, kills the worker session at the end. So it's the, WO, the WDIO CLI kicks off um, the local runner the local runner kicks off the runner, and the runner kicks then off the framework. It's, it's, uh, it is complicated for sure, but it, it needs all these layers to properly have abstract the complexity away and have this, every, have this separated in multiple different packages that we can you know, replace with each other. So we can replace every framework from Cucumber to Mocker uh, by just you know, modifying the config uh, we can, we want to be able to just allow you to run tests locally or a Lambda function at some day where you can, you know, you should be essentially be able to run thousand tests in parallel without your using your CPU on your machine. Um, so that's why it needs this layering and all these complex functions. But what you, the easiest part to do is just, you know, follow along the code, get like an idea about what every package is doing and then see where you can apply the changes to. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Christian, because uh, whenever you will pick up an issue that's, uh, that has to do with a, a package that we have or a service that we have, then you'll notice that every package requires its own expertise. For example, somebody that's working on the uh, Cucumber uh, framework has to have some Cucumber knowledge. If yeah. you are going to working, uh, going to be working on a reporter, for example, the Allure reporter, then you will have to know a little bit about Allure, um, and this is for all packages uh, this way. Uh, yeah, good point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like I don't, I haven't contributed to the Allure reporter and to Cucumber a lot, and I always need, I always hope that someone else can, you know, jump in that has more more knowledge about Cucumber and the Allure reporter than me than I have. Um, so, you know, you can, if you like the Allure reporter, you can just look into what the Allure reporter is doing, help us out with the box and, you know, make the Allure reporter better over time. Uh, that would be awesome. And here's, again, a general project overview, which is really well uh, described. So you have the, as I mentioned before, the CLI, um, which kicks off the test. If you say WDIO run and you apply your config file, then uses the launcher to get information from your config file 
and based on your runner information, which is currently always local, it starts a WDR runner. And that runner initializes the services that you have in your config file, the reporters that you have in your config file, and the framework that you define to run your testing. And then it uses initializes a session with rep.io and attaches the browser instance to the global scope so you can run use it in your test. That's pretty much it. Anyone with questions to a specific area of Reptile.io, no matter if it's code or you know how we create the documentation or anything to the contribution process. If not, I would use a chance to <clears throat> to go back into the IDE and <clears throat> deploy or work on the documentation or say something about the documentation page. So WebDAO has the documentation in the code. Um, we have in the docs directory, all the documentation pages that you see in WebDAO slash guide. Um, I think that's it, right? This is WebDAO. Everything that you see in uh, when you click on the docs link on the top. <clears throat> so we have the API markdown, the documentation for custom services. It's all written in, in markdown. We have the flow charts here. And we have <clears throat> the API uh, documentation uh, too. And then that's pretty much it. What there are, we have scripts that then look into the WebDAVIO package for and looks, scrapes all the commands that we have defined and pretty much creates out of this information the documentation for a specific command. So, for instance, here this is the, the implementation for the custom selector strategy. And on top of the file, we have a comment block where we have the documentation, a little code example, and some meta information um, for parameters and the return values. And Reptile uses all this information to generate the documentation as you can see it um, in the docs. So let me see. <clears throat> So it uses this, it parses this example block and creates a nice uh, section with a, a highlighted uh, code snippet um, to show how to use the command. And we use the parameter section here to create this little table that tells you what kind of parameters are expected and what um, they do. So this is actually interesting. We see, um, we see here that there's no description for the strategy name and the strategy argument. Um, so someone could you know, take this and add the documentation to it by just modifying this file and adding a proper uh, documentation to this parameter. So let's say strategy name should be a strategy um, uh, describe strategy name for the custom, the custom strategy applied. I don't know, something like that. And for the strategy argument, uh, as we can see here, this is a function. So actually we should, no, this is uh, any argument because once we add a selector strategy, give it a name, we apply a custom function to it uh, that will ex be executed in the browser. So this can be any argument. You can pass in a number to give you the third element of something, um, depending on what your custom strategy is. 
And then you can see here uh, par the parameters that are applied to <clears throat> that are applied to um, strategy. Sorry, to the strategy. To the strategy. So we can save this, and now if we um, build the docs, and you can do this by going into the website directory where our website is located and just run npm start. It now compiles all the uh, markdown files. It downloads the service sweetmeats from external services. It compiles the SAS scripts or the SAS styles and starts a website on localhost 3000. So I will uh, change my screen to look into the browser. So you should now see the browser. And this is now the website running on localhost 3000. And if we now click on API and go into the custom dollar function, we see now that the documentation has been applied to this table. We can compare to the current deployed website on webdriver.io, custom dollar sign, and we see that these table cells are empty. And now with the change that we made to the specific command, we have some information about the parameters. So I don't want to do make this change. So everyone on this call in the workshop, they can you know make a suggestion of how this documentation can look like based on the you know example. Feel also free to add the dot here and some other documentation that can be useful for this command and um, make a change for this simple um, uh, documentation change. I mean we can just do this. Let's say. Um, we create a new branch, hit checkout minus B to create a new branch, and then say, push my initials, and then custom uh, dollar, I think branch name should not start with dollar, just custom doc change. Any random branch name will do. Then you commit your changes that you do to the command check what you have committed and then uh, just say have a descriptive message for your uh, commit we don't have any rules here like in other projects uh, because there's we don't have any automations around commits messages yet um, so just feel free to say update docs um, we're, we're not seeing these uh, changes i think uh, christian Is that oh right, right right okay uh let me change back to my id uh, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, share screen back to the ID. So again, I just checked um, what I, what has changed. Then I added with git add the file, and then now I make the commit. I have like some shortcuts here, but essentially it's the same. If you say git commit update docs. And then you can push it to your remote branch, to, to your fork. Uh, since you don't have uh, access rights to the repository yet, if you're not a project committer, you need to use your own fork. Um, so just say, you know, if you have, you can check your forks, say git remote minus v. If you want to add a fork, uh, your fork, you can say git remote add, then say upstream, that's your fork name and then get enter your git URL from your fork. So it would be github.com slash username slash webdriver.io. That's usually the URL for it. In my case, I'm I can use the main repository. So I just say um, git git push should do the trick. Oh, there we go. Git push set of stream reach in. I've been a member of the steering committee for so long. I didn't even do this before. 
I always work in my own uh, fork, to be honest. So. I mean, yeah, there's no reason why not to continue using your fork. Um, I just, yeah. Yeah, I know. And then since recently, GitHub allows, gives you the link that sends you to the page where you can make your pull request. Um, interestingly, it has no changes, choose different branch, uh, CB. Yeah, I, I think for, if, if you want to show this, then you have to switch again. Uh, oh yeah, uh, good point. Stop sharing, screen share. Share this. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, okay, it didn't. Oh, it didn't copy this properly. There we go. This is a problem when working with this shell. Oh. This is a thing that you usually get. This is a full change. So you say update docs to um, custom to the command custom dollar sign, <clears throat> then make a short description um, about what you have changed. Um, say it's a documentation change or you have a bug fix or if you have something that doesn't apply to it, just feel free to add a custom, a custom checkbox, whatever. Um, the checklist helps us to you know, make sure that you've read the contributing mark guidelines um, you added tests if necessary for documentation, it's usually not. Um, you have added post necessary documentation and you have added proper type description, which is also not appropriate or applicable for this type of change. And then for the comments, you can leave this out. And then uh, uh, yeah, thank you for joining us, uh, Quinn. Um, I think we will, you know, I will not make this, um, this pull request because this is something that you can do, adding this little documentation change, which is a great first way to entry to contributing something to WebDevO. There's a bunch of commands. Um, if I switch back to the IDE, there are a bunch of commands where we could definitely use some better documentation um, and more examples. Let's say, I don't know, switch commands. Or in the element part, you know, we usually have one line of description that can be enhanced, whatever you find useful. But I hope this will kind of like show how you can, you know, set up your, the website and run the website and see how your changes to the documentation will be applied. Uh, automatically. All right, stop sharing. Christian. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if Quinn's still here. I think he already left. But he was asking if the video will be posted somewhere. Exactly. We will post the video on the contributing page on webdriver.io. Uh, so on the top bar, you see a contribute link and mm -hmm. we will once we get the recording we will either upload it on youtube or the i think the foundation will um, will host this video somewhere and we will embed that video on that contribution page all right So I'm guessing still no questions from, from anyone. Did anyone start to work on a specific issue or topic?
Yeah, you know, J- Jithin is uh, started uh, is going to start something, uh, and will report back if he faces any issues. So that's uh, great. Do you know what you will uh, try picking up, uh, Jithin? Um, I was just going through the issues that are raised. So, uh, like, uh, I was like thinking I'll pick up the Dev Tools wala issue, which is like recently raised. Awesome. Uh, like, I think there was some issue with the nightly version. So I was just going. Oh through. yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Any any help on this Dev Tools uh, project um, would be awesome. And you know, yes. again, the best thing to start is just write yourself a minimal script that you know runs the Dev Tools package. Like I can let me share actually my screen. What how my setup usually looks like. Uh, so this is my local checkout, and I, you see here I have files A, B, and C, which are random files that I create for myself. And in A, for instance, I use the DevTools package to just uh, run the simple script. And you know, if I want to test if the DevTools package is able to connect to Firefox, I can you know just work on this my example script, and over time these scripts evolve and evolve and you know, it helped me to debug, to debug certain things and work on certain things. I have like v.js that have a, a minimal example to connect to source labs. I uh, have c.js that have an example to run um, some things, I guess, Chrome or Firefox with some binary setup. You know, just have a simple script somewhere in the root directory that you can always execute. Like here, I could just say, a.js and it should try to launch Chrome and run the specific script. Maybe it's a good idea to actually uh, add the, these to the uh, to the project for people to just get started with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess they would could be cool to add them to the not end to end uh, to the DevTools example or to the what would. You, what would be the best way? Uh, or a standalone folder where we just have some standalone scripts like here? Yeah, maybe. Because uh, if, if you put it separately, then I think it's clear what they can be used for. If, if you put them alongside the uh, examples, it's not really a, an example. It's um, a script that can be used to debug while you're uh, uh, working on something. Hmm. Yeah, that could be. But I, I, I've honestly never done this, to, and uh, it's. I think this is very useful to do. Like the the simple script here, or yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Marin, you know, if you. Usually, if people make pack changes, they sometimes also try to link the packages in here to their current projects where they uh, where they discover the problem. That could be yeah. possible too. Uh, I've never done this, but there. So I don't have a documentation for this. So if you if you work like this, um, feel free to add a documentation for, uh, to us, or just you know just file an issue and with the documentation and we can find out where it fits uh, into it, where, where we can put it on the webdriver.io website. Yeah, yeah I can, I've tried to do that, but honestly, um, I've run into some issues before. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I can, I can certainly uh, do something about what I know so far. So I find, yeah, I find linking projects hard because sometimes your changes are in multiple sub projects and this makes it difficult to have to link all the packages, which is why we have the smoke tests, for instance, in slash tests. Um, there's one runner file that um, uses the, the launcher um, to launch WebDiveRo test runner test. Uh, so you see here it launches this specific convi- config file with this um, adapt or modification to it. So we want to run this these test files, and in these directories you can check like the test.js. It pretty much you runs a user test how someone could have it in his uh, 
in this project. But instead of calling an actual driver, it uses an internal helper package they called WebDriver mock service to return a pre-created pre response. Um, so you can look into that. So this WebDriver mock service, it defines mocks for all the protocol commands that we have. So you see here, every time that WebDriver uh, calls the get title command, it always returns 200 with this response. And so if you, if you run your mock tests or your, um, your, your smoke tests, uh, calling browser.getTitle will always return the same response. And you don't need any driver or anything to run these tests. These are like unit tests, but they run fully end-to-end -end, um, without the networking part, without making actual requests. Um, so this is really helpful if you want to test these interactions with services and reporters and if they work really well together. Like we have tests here that make sure that the commands are executed synchronously um, or asynchronously, as you can see here, that you can use async as well without problems. We test our middleware um, where we set up a specific set of responses and then we execute the commands and based on the set of responses that we expect to happen, we see that, for instance, the stale element is being fixed automatically. Uh, for instance, for that one, you can see this scenario is a custom command that's being added by the mock server. And you can find it here. It's added in the before hook because this web driver mock service is like the source service or any other services, the service that you can use to do certain things on special lifecycle events, like before the test starts. And here we have the scenario that defines this um, set of responses. Like for here, the first time that you try to uh, query an element, uh, return with a valid response. The second time you do that, uh, say no such element. Uh, so it means uh, we found the element, but once we click on it, um, it says it, we cannot find it anymore. And this is usually happens when there's a stale element exception. And then after that, we find it again with a new element ID and um, are allow to click on this specific element ID and make the click happen. So this is all described in this little scenario, which uses uh, knock as a stubbing framework. So, but you can use the smock service to, you know, run the full test runner, WDO test runner suite, similar to what we have in the examples directory without having to set up like the driver and um, yeah, without having to set up the driver. And you can run this by saying uh, npm run uh, test smoke and say to filter it, you can have as an argument the name of the function here. So mocker test runner, if we apply this, it only wants the smoke test for the mocker test runner. So four files are being executed. And they pass. I think it's worth mentioning that uh, what you see over here are not the web driver IO commands, but it's actually the web driver commands that are mocked, right? Yes. Yes, so that's right. Web, so web driver IO is actually executing all the commands and, and doing the requests, but it's doing the request to web driver and there it's stopping. And I think the request is not really actually happening because the whole HD the the um, request module is like mocked so that the request doesn't go out um, and knock takes like makes the mock and returns the expected response. So you see that this dot command dot delete session or get title, these are all mapped to the protocol commands that we have defined in WDIO protocols um, for the web driver. So here you see all the events. Uh, let's say get title. 
this is a protocol command for this web driver endpoint. And you, we can modify it by calling, where's the service? By calling sys.command get title, and then we get the knock instance where we can use their interfaces to say, uh, always return 200 with this response. I think it, it's maybe worth uh, showing the uh, get title WIO command. Uh, this driver, is, this is the protocol command, so there's no code behind it, essentially. No, no, but, but what I'm trying to say is like, if you show the uh, web driver IO get title command, then you will see this get used in that command, which might make it more visible. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so in one of the smoke tests, we had um, essentially this, which under the hood calls browser.getTitle. Yeah, which is the web driver IO command. Yeah. But then in turns, in turn, it uses the web driver get title command. Yeah. Which is then mapped to a specific URL. And what we showed in the uh, protocol mapping, that URL can actually be called with a tool, for example, Postman as well. So it's exactly. just calls that you're doing, like requests, HTTP requests. That's what Erwin has explained in the layering. So the first initial layer, when you use WebDriver, the package itself has just five or four files really. And it just does, it just runs a command based on the information it gets from the protocol that I just have shown from the WebDriver JSON, where we have the command name um, and the parameters it expects. So here, where do we have a parameter? Here we expect an x, y width height uh, variable. And based on that, we can do some validation of the parameters that you have provided. And essentially, it just makes a request at the end. This is all what the web driver package is doing. It helps you to, it has, it provides an interface and it gives you the bare response back, where then WebDriver.io can go. Can, which then WebDriver can use to make some more complex commands. Let's say the keys commands, where we you know, either uh, use the send keys commands that still existed when the JSY protocol was a thing, and now it uses the perform actions command. Or the new window command that does some fancy things to create a new window and um, <clears throat> switches to it automatically. So it uses these, the execute command, the get window handles protocol command, and the switch to window uh, protocol command to, actually, this is the WebDriver command, but the WebDriver command to open a new window and switch to that window. Switch window is similar, where it, yeah, switches to the window, uses the protocol command, and then does some abstraction on top of it, just like a, a layer on top protocol commands. And for DevTools, to complete this, we have implemented all the WebDriver commands, but have put a Puppeteer implementation behind it. So for element clear, uh, which clears the input element, we just say, uh, oh, we have a specific command for that, a specific JavaScript that we execute on this page to clear that input using some parameters. Um, the click command is a little bit more complicated, but it pretty much just um, clicks on the command. Oh, no, this is element click, yeah. It gets the, OK, that's with tag name. If not, it says element handle.click. So it uses the puppeteer function to click on that element, but it is wrapped around uh, some mechanism that in case a dialog opens, uh, that will be handled properly. So yeah, I think we are almost on top of the hour. 
Um, any questions before we close the session? I hope this was somewhat, somewhat useful for you. Um, if you have some time after the session, uh, I would like to ask you to give your feedback to the session in the document on the Kiko platform. Uh, let me share, uh, switch my screen again. Just up to, so I think this one is shared now. So here on the Kiko platform where you found the link to the workshop session, you have a section on uh, session feedback. <clears throat> and please provide some information about how you like the session uh, or some more information how we can improve next time when we give this workshop again, I hope. So feel free to add any feedback there. Yeah, I guess besides that, thank you all for participating. Um, and I think I will stop the recording.